video is brought to you by masks. The longer you don't wear one, the longer we get to stay in quarantine. And now that we have that out of the way, hello everyone, my name is Helen and welcome back to Women in Film Reviews. In case you're new here, I upload videos every other Thursday about films written and or directed by women where we talk a little bit more in depth about them than a five minute review allows time for. And today, Oh boy, do we have a doozy. Don't worry, it's just squash. <laughs> I would never actually drink on camera. Maybe. Today on Women in Film Reviews, we are going to be talking about the 2019 film Captain Marvel, directed by Anna Boden and Ryan Fleck, and starring Brie Larson as our titular female superhero. You may notice that of all of the nine now women in film reviews I've done on this channel that a good third of them are now female superhero movies. That is partly because they are the most visible and obvious choices to talk about because there are a lot of things to dissect about them. Both Wonder Woman and Birds of Prey warranted lengthy reviews from me. But Captain Marvel is the film that seems to have drawn the most controversy in all directions, really. I have some thoughts on this movie. They're not all positive. I'm just going to put that right out the gate. But without further ado, let's get into it. So as I mentioned, Captain Marvel was directed by Anna Boden and Ryan Fleck. The screenplay credit is given to Bowden, Fleck, and Geneva Robertson Dwart. Additional story credit goes to the three aforementioned screenplay authors, plus Disney mainstays Meg LaFave and Nicole Perlman. Meg LaFave, of course, was one of the writers on the Academy Award nominated Inside Out, and Nicole Perlman is a longtime member of the Marvel Writers Room and has a co screenplay credit on Guardians of the Galaxy 1. Among their previous credits, Bowden and Fleck directed the 2006 film Half Nelson, which garnered Ryan Gosling a Best Actor nomination. This was released on March 8th, 2019, with a ton of fanfare. As is the case with a lot of Marvel movies, the budget for the film was somewhere in the market of 150 to 175 million, and it managed to gross at the box office $1.128 billion. <sighs> Man, the things I would do with a billion dollars. The critical response, uh, as it stands right now, it has a 78% on Rotten Tomatoes. We'll get to the audience score in a minute. So, what is Captain Marvel? Captain Marvel tells the story of Carol Danvers, who is a human who, through an accident, gained Kree superpowers and is now living on the Kree home planet, mentored by Yon Rog, who is played by Jude Law, and the supreme intelligence who appears to Carol as in the form of Annette Bening. She has a character name, I just can't remember what it is right now. Oh man, this is going great, isn't it? While on the Kree home planet, Carol Danvers goes by the name Veers because she has lost all memory of anything that had happened prior to her arrival there. During an ambush, she is captured by the scrolls, and she starts to regain some of her memories from Earth past. She was a former fighter pilot in the US Air Force, and she discovers that the project that she had been working on prior was going to be key for the scrolls' survival. She subsequently learns that the things that she was taught by Yon Rog and her fellow Kree soldiers were a lie, and she has to now become a superhero and to fight against everything that she ever believed in and try to become who she really wants to be. Along the way, she crash lands on Earth in the year 1995 and meets Nick Fury and Agent Coulson, who are, even in this iteration, played by Samuel L. Jackson and Clark Gregg. She also reunites with her former friend Maria Rambo, played by Lashana Lynch, and she goes on a journey of self-discovery. So before we go into some of the more in-depth topics that I would like to talk about with this film, I am first going to talk about the things that I like about it because there are quite a few things to like about it. First, I would like to say that the performances across the board are very good. Brie Larson is a very good and interesting Captain Marvel. She plays this character who does have amnesia and is trying to reconnect the dots about what her past is like. And then once she does find out, and finds out that everything that she knows 
as Veers is a lie, you can tell that she is having some trouble accepting it and she really, anyone in that situation would have some degree of PTSD. Some people think that Larson was a bit too wooden. I don't necessarily think that that's the case. I think that she is playing a character that for the last six years has been told that emotions are a weakness. They will be used against her at some points. And some of that is true. Anger is something that can often be used against a protagonist, but she's also taught that happiness, joking, her, pers her very quirky personality, that also needs to be suppressed. And so I think she's learning who she was beforehand, but she's also learning to use those emotions in a positive way and that it's okay to have those emotions throughout the film. So I think uh, Brie Larson does a really good job bringing that across. I enjoy the character dynamics between characters in this movie. I think that Carol and Nick Fury work well together as a team. And I also think that Carol and Maria Rambo's friendship is explored to an extent and they do get along quite great, but I wish we had gone into it more and hopefully we will in Captain Marvel 2. The point being is everyone for the most part acted really well off each other. I believe them as characters, I just wish we got to spend more quality time with them. As far as the costume goes, I think it, that has a really good origin story and it's also not built to be super overly sexualized, which is a kind of a problem that I do have with Wonder Woman. And I also appreciate that the appearance that Brie Larson and as Carol Danvers is given in the movie is not some form of unobtainable beauty. <laughs> I will always point to the scene where she falls through the blockbuster roof and she gets up and her hair is all frizzy and I was like, yes, that is exactly how her hair would be in this situation. <laughs> and in amongst all of the big action scenes happening throughout the film, I think that these smaller character moments are done quite well. Everything that is within Maria Rambo's home is pretty well done. Um, there's moments between Veers and Jan Rog at the beginning of the movie that I quite liked and I wish we would have spent some more time on those as opposed to big bombastic set pieces. There are a lot of people that think that Carol Danvers in this film is a Mary Sue. I would offer that even if Mary Sue was a term that I liked to use, she doesn't necessarily fit this description. She may have this power imbued in her but she still has to learn how to use it properly. To quote one Uncle Ben, with great power comes great responsibility. Marble. Also, why is Mary Sue a bad thing? I mean, men get to be automatically great in almost everything without anyone batting an eye. So, there's that. So, that about covers everything that I liked about this movie. Before I get into talking about the flaws, because there's a lot to talk about there, I just want to establish that when I am talking about these flaws, I am of the firm belief, and you can have a different opinion, but I'm of the firm belief that the flaws that are inherent to this movie have absolutely nothing to do with the decision to cast a female lead for the most part. Um, there are a couple things, but the problems in this film would exist still if everything was the same except Carol Danvers was a man, and these are problems that are endemic to the MCU as a whole and not just to this movie. I feel like a lot of people who have problems with Captain Marvel tend to ignore said problems when they are present in other MCU films. Okay? Good? Let's get into it. We often say this about the MCU now that we are 20 something films in, but more and more these films tend to feel like they are made by committee instead of with an individual strong voice guiding the story. Unfortunately, Captain Marvel is pretty much the epitome of this. You saw when I was listing off the screenplay credits in the beginning of this video that I listed no less than five people. For those of you who are unfamiliar about how Marvel works, they have a writer's room, quote unquote, something akin to that, where they toss around ideas for heroes to make movies about. This was the case for 
Guardians of the Galaxy getting made um, to an extent for Black Panther, for Doctor Strange. Basically for characters that aren't necessarily in the original six in the Avengers. Nicole Perlman, who I mentioned earlier, has been a part of that and that's how she initially came to the project. I think the fault of this movie in particular, Marvel was very behind on getting a female superhero movie made and as a result, I guess put quite frankly, this movie has way too many jobs to do. It has to be a Captain Marvel origin story and Kevin Feige has specifically said that they chose Captain Marvel to be their first female superhero-led movie because they wanted to tell an origin story, even though Black Widow's getting a movie and we didn't need an origin story for her. Great. It is trying to be a Captain Marvel origin story, but it also, by virtue of when it's set, has the unenviable task of setting up the entire MCU as we know it. You can argue that Captain America the First Avenger had the same job, kind of, but it didn't have nearly as much to set up in that movie. It was very much more focused on Cap's story in particular. And at that point, even though we were four films into the MCU, we still had no idea how big and successful this franchise media behemoth overlord was going to become. My point being, this movie cannot be two different origin stories and be able to reach the full potential of each of them. They really should have just called this movie Nick Fury because they are way more concerned with setting up how he becomes part of the MCU later than they are with telling Captain Marvel's origin story. Sorry, not sorry. That's what I got from watching it. I should also point out that before I watched this movie last night for this review, the last time I had seen this movie was in cinemas last March. And by last March, I mean March of 2019 because who was seeing movies in March this year? Absolutely no one. I did enjoy it when it came out. There were things that were refreshing, but I think we can look at it with its flaws now. I don't have enough time to get into just how convoluted the pre-production and development for this film was because it is a wild ride. Please go read the Wikipedia page. I beg you, I will leave it in the description. <laughs> this falls into some of the same tropes that MCU movies as of late tend to fall into. The production design is quite bland. It's quite dark. It doesn't necessarily differentiate itself from other Marvel movies, save for a couple. We are used to having plot twists in Marvel movies at this point. The scroll plot twist wasn't as bad as some others in the MCU, mainly because we got to know these characters, but it still certainly feels rushed. So, problems with the MCU as a whole. Buckle up. We are at a point in time, and it's happened so quickly it seems like, because the MCU is only 12 years old, despite having like 22, three, however many movies they have. We cannot take everything that happens in one Marvel movie at this point at face value with the stuff that's happening in world. The MCU is so sprawling and so interconnected at this point that we cannot watch a Marvel movie and only think about what is happening in this story and the implications of everything the plot has on everything that will happen within the two odd hours that we wa are watching this movie. We are forced to think at every single turn and especially in this movie about the movie's implications on the other 20 odd films in the MCU. And not only that, but we are also forced to think about Marvel the brand itself throughout because it just is humongous at this point. It's not funny. The importance of the brand of the MCU has superseded the importance of story in the MCU. Again, bar a couple of examples. I would say the two major exceptions at this point, um, at least in the last five years, are Thor Ragnarok and Black Panther. These were more or less conceived and written by writers and directors outside of the MCU in-house writing staff. Um, that would be Taika Waititi and Ryan Coogler, respectively. I don't think it's a coincidence that these two movies are also the two movies that have the least concern with what is happening in the wider universe, except for a couple throwaway lines. 
they are allowed to be their own movies and to explore those characters without having to worry about what it means in the context of the larger MCU. I want to bring up something that all of you film school nerds will probably know. At this point, I would like to bring up one person that anybody in the film industry knows of. That would be the great Marshall McLuhan. Godspeed, my brother. Yes, for you youngins, that is the guy who has a cameo in Annie Hall. The reason I want to bring Marshall McLuhan up here is because he has a saying called, medium is the message. And basically what it boils down to is that each medium of telling a story, be it film, be it stage, be it the stage musical or straight plays, television, poetry, prose, novels, what have you, journalism. Each of these mediums has a specific language that is used to tell a story, and some stories specifically are better told in one medium than another. This is why you often hear the phrase, the book was better than the movie, because it was conceived as a book and it doesn't always translate well. The most prime recent example is probably Cats the Musical, which arguably didn't work as well on stage, but was still intended for the stage and Cats the movie, which so clearly was never meant to be a movie. I bring this up here because what Kevin Feige and what Marvel Studios are trying to do in establishing a universe with all of these characters who can have their own story and come together every two or three years or so, I don't think it fits the medium that they are trying to do it in. Telling the stories of these countless superheroes in sprawling, flashy epics is better suited for comic books rather than for movies. I will refer to you to Patrick H. Willem's brilliant trilogy of videos on the problems with the MCU as a whole. He talks about this a little bit more in depth and why it feels like we don't have time to get to know these characters in these two or three movies a year. Basically, the work that Marvel is trying to do with Captain Marvel is something that, sure, could be done in a year-long comic book arc where you get 12 issues a year and you can read them in your own time and they are incredibly visual and can tell the story that way better, but this doesn't necessarily work for a two and a half hour long movie. In this movie, we don't have time to get to know the most powerful hero in the MCU, according to Kevin Feige, Carol Danvers, because we are way too concerned with trying to set up as many other Avengers plot points as we can. We have to set up the Kree race because we already met them in Guardians of the Galaxy, so we have to have Jimon Honsu's character in here, even though he really doesn't need to be. This could have been any Kree person, really. We have to set up how Nick Fury comes up with the Avengers initiative name, and we have to set up how he got his scar. He might as well have just looked straight into the camera and said, do you want to know how I got these scars? Wrong universe. As I said earlier, this does make it more of a Nick Fury slash S.H.I.E.L.D. origin story than a Captain Marvel origin story. She gets lost in all this plot. Speaking of the DCEU, I'm going to compare it positively to the MCU for a second. Hold on. They are not as concerned at this point with continuity or being in the same universe. Clearly, we have two different versions of the Joker. Wonder Woman and Birds of Prey are two wildly different superhero movies that are allowed to be their own thing because they are so not concerned with connecting their continuity to anything else that DC is putting out. And because we're not concerned with that, we get to know these characters better and we get to care for them. I care more about the mercenary Harley Quinn than I do about Captain Marvel in this movie. And one of them used to be a villain. Now, of course, this is a feminist film. And I appreciate the fact that Marvel has put out a film with a female lead. I wish we could have done that a lot sooner with Black Widow or even Agent Carter, even though she did get her own TV series, but they really, they bungled that one, didn't they? And also Captain Marvel wasn't a woman until 2012 anyways, so. There's that for you. My point being, even though this is a feminist piece, and I do appreciate feminist pieces, I have a channel talking about them, but these raw, raw girl power moments in the film feel very on the nose. This is 
Marvel being, oh crap, <laughs> people are mad at us because we haven't made a movie with a female superhero in it. Uh, here, 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 here's all these girl power tropes. Yes, please, all these, all these from like the last 30 years. Here, here, are you happy now? No. <sighs> Basically, Marvel is trying really hard to prove to you that they are not sexist. See, look, we cast a woman. It's like that Billy Eichner bit where he just runs up to someone on the street and goes, name a woman. Well, you named one, Marvel. Can you name more? The moments that they are trying to play as feminist, everything that was feminist in the marketing, in the film's context, it has absolutely nothing to do with Carol's status as a woman, it's more about her status as a human in general. Like the very end where she overpowers the supreme intelligence and the supreme intelligence calling her weak. The supreme intelligence is not calling her weak because she's a woman. It's because that she's a human. If she was a man, they would have done the same thing. But we gotta have our she gets back up moment and to put in marketing and Yes. There are two ways, in my opinion, to make a film a feminist film. You can either have her have a hero's journey, a hero's arc, which is on par with what male superheroes have had for a while, and we can choose to not draw attention to the fact that she's a woman, which in itself is kind of feminist. Or you can choose to have her femininity be a part of her strength and be a part of what makes her great and what helps her to defeat the Kree. There is a way to do both. I don't really know what that is, but I think Wonder Woman kind of balances that scale quite well. But here's the thing. You cannot conflate the in-universe use of telling a story in the former tactic with your real-world intentions on the latter tactic. It just doesn't mix. It feels like it's there to say, hey, we don't hate women. I do wish this movie was better. I think that a lot of people were riding on this movie to be like the feminist homecoming for Marvel. And the fact that DC kind of got there first doesn't really help. But if this movie was just as good, if not slightly better than Wonder Woman, I wouldn't immediately abandon Wonder Woman. I think it's great. I think we can have more than one female superhero movie in this universe and have them be great and coexist and love them for different ways. Like I say, this and Birds of Prey and Wonder Woman are all very tonally different. They tell stories in all different time periods now that I think about it. And that's okay. I just feel like I've never been a big fan of the MCU. Maybe you'll just have to look it through this in entire review through that lens, but I haven't really appreciated the way that they seem to tell stories by committee, and it sucks that Captain Marvel is on one of the biggest victims of this tactic. As I say, there are a lot of aspects that I liked. I think the cast, for the most part, was great. I can't wait to see what happens with Captain Marvel next. Captain Marvel 2 is happening. It is coming out in 2022. And it is going to be directed by Nia DaCosta, which I am super excited about. I have heard her films Little Woods and Candyman have gotten outstanding reviews, and I would like to review one, if not both, for this channel. My hopes for Captain Marvel 2 is that it will not be as concerned as Captain Marvel 1 about connecting Carol's story to the larger MCU because I would like to see more intimate character moments with her and how she has dealt with everything. Captain Marvel 2 also will not be burdened with telling an MCU origin story. Hopefully we can get more time with Maria Rambo, maybe with Nick Fury, although I think maybe we can leave him aside for this point. And of course, more of Goose. More of the cat, please. So, what is this film's legacy? It, uh, it is directly responsible for Rotten Tomatoes finally making sure people actually see movies before they give it an audience score. So yes, in case you are unaware, Rotten Tomatoes did have to change the system with which they give audience scores because a lot of people were giving this thousands of very, very, very negative reviews before the movie even came out. There's no way 58,000 people 
saw this movie and didn't like it before March 8th, 2019. I cannot believe that that was a flaw with Rotten Tomatoes that nobody noticed until 2019, but the internet figured it out. There's that, if, if you would like to learn more about that, um, Wikipedia. I enjoy that it is given Brie Larson, a, an actress who I have liked for a long time. I remember she was very great in Scott Pilgrim vs. The World and The Addams for Life. And I also really enjoyed her turn in Room. She is an incredible actress and I appreciate that she is using her platform to try and make change in the way that her movies are made and also trying to use her platform to encourage diversity in the people who review the films because let's be honest the uh, the critic community is overwhelmingly male as evidenced by the fact that they gave princess diaries to a 20 something percent on rotten tomatoes i really just want to talk captain marvel is in avengers endgame that's all i know but that, that's that's really all i know at this point I, I haven't bothered to watch endgame i just that that is how disinterested i am in the mcu except for thor love and thunder make it good Taika. In conclusion, I hope that the Black Widow movie that we are going to get hopefully at the end of this year in cinemas is better. There was a lot of potential for this movie, I'm not gonna lie, but Captain Marvel ultimately got swept up in all of the problems that the MCU has at this point. That's my verdict. Thank you guys so much for watching and sitting through this. Lord knows I didn't think I would have this many opinions about Captain Marvel as a movie, but here we are. I think it's important to talk about. I tried to look at some analysis videos that were done by women on YouTube, get a couple other perspectives, but they're all pretty much done by men. So uh, I, will, uh, I will take up the mantle and I wanted to get through um, as much of my personal thesis statement as I could. So I hope this has been useful for you. Be sure to subscribe here for more women in film reviews every other Thursday. If you would like to help choose those reviews, you can go to my Patreon, patreon.com slash Helen I do put a poll out with three movie options the week prior to filming, so you can have a bit of a say in what I talk about next. You can also subscribe to my second channel for more casual vlogs. I think that seeping into this channel maybe a little bit. Don't, do not worry, I'm not actually drinking alcohol on camera. I did just put up a Reading Rush Reflections review finally after about a month of the Reading Rush being complete. I really enjoyed talking about that so make sure to go check that out when you're done here. As I say, you can support me on Patreon. You can check out my website helen grothuiscom to see all of my most recent content in one place, including my written blogs. You can make sure to follow me on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook and Tumblr if you fancy. All of those links will be in the description down below. I will also link to some of the sources that I used for this analysis. Let me know your thoughts on Captain Marvel in the comments. I am genuinely curious because Lord knows this movie has spawned a variety of opinions and even if they're different to mine, I don't necessarily think they're wrong. Thank you guys so much for watching. Remember to keep living awesome lives and I will see you in two weeks. <laughs> Bye.